Thank you for joining us. We're glad you are with us for this new and improved second edition of Interfaith Environmental Justice for Changemakers. I'm Kyle Kreider, and I'm here with Executive Director Reverend Michael Malcolm. Reverend Malcolm is Executive Director of both Alabama Interfaith Power and Light and the People's Justice Council, and I'm Program and Policy Director for both organizations. So, Rev, what would you like to tell folks uh, about this new and improved version of the course? What do you want them to get out of Interfaith Environmental Justice for Changemakers? Well, first and foremost, let me also welcome you. Thank you for sign signing up to our class. It is great to be with you, and I look forward to being with you throughout your journey through this course. Uh, here's what I'd like for you to know. I'd like for you to know that we mix faith with our environmental justice priorities. We ensure that we are operating from a moral standpoint and we are calling out those things that are immoral and calling those things as immoral. It is not our job to fix anyone. It isn't our job to change anyone. It is our job simply to hold up a mirror to ensure that you see yourself so that you can change and you can be fixed. The same thing we do uh, in faith is the same thing that we do with society. We hold up a mirror to society. This course helps us to have the tools so that we can hold up that mirror and point out to society where it's an error so that it can get back in line with what it means to be community. Thank you, Rev. Your own faith tradition, the United Church of Christ, has a very interesting record with environmental justice, and some of our uh, students might not be aware of that. Would you like to share a little bit about your, your tradition? Yeah, I'm always grateful to share about our tradition, Kyle, because our tradition, as far as the United Church of Christ, is deeply rooted in the origins of environmental justice. In fact, we were the very first ones to come out with a report on environmental justice called toxic waste and race where we actually did a, they did a survey on various um, uh, communities and found out um, that the environmental injustices that we face were segmented um, predominantly to the black community and in the black community you can find um, and one in five families living next to an environmental injustice area or in an environmental justice area and it was there that uh, Reverend Dr. Benjamin Chavis um, coined the phrase uh, environmental racism and now we look at environmental racism today and after that Many of our uh, forebearers and, and uh, some even now who are our ancestors carried that mantle. And I'm grateful, so very grateful, to have an opportunity to have relationship with uh, a good many of them. Thank you, Rev. So many faith traditions have uh, kind of a dual nature. They, they typically have an orthodoxy, a right thinking. But there's also an orthopraxis, a right, you know, putting our faith into action. Absolutely. What are some ways that you would like to see students uh, put their faith into action? Yeah, so the lessons that you'll learn in this class, the lessons that you'll learn throughout this course, the, the things that we open your eyes to in this course will help you to build up that advocacy toolbox. Uh, it'll help you to see the various things that are happening in your environment, in your community, and to see those that you would normally overlook. Uh, and it will um, give you the tools to advocate for those that are underserved and overlooked. And so what I'm hoping for is that you would not only grab the lessons that are um, given in these courses, but you'll also take those lessons and use them to help society. Use them by way of your preaching, by way of your teaching. Use them by way of your advocacy, by way of your demonstrations. Use them by way of your academia. Use them by way of your studies, your research. Use them however you can use them, but be able to use them to advocate for the greater good. Amen, Rev. So, you and I both are big believers in the importance of storytelling and the power of storytelling. Um, would you share one, one story from, I, I know you've been on a listening and lifting tour. Would you, would you share one, one story from the road? Yeah, so this summer, uh, Cal, uh, uh, as you know, because you went on, on a couple of them with me, 
Uh, I spent time with communities throughout the South and beyond. Um, it was from Minnesota all the way down to Miami, Florida, mm -hmm. um, that uh, I was able to go throughout the summer, spend time with communities that are experiencing environmental injustice. And I'll give you one case in point because it, it speaks of not only the suffering of a community, but also the resilience of a community as well. Well, in, in Uniontown, Alabama, which is uh, seated in our uh, home or our headquarters of Birmingham uh, or the proximity thereof, uh, Uniontown, Alabama is a rural black community. Uh, and Cal accompanied me on this particular trip where we had an opportunity to go out out with Cornell University, uh, Dr. Shorna uh, Allred, and uh, one of the students, as well as some of the uh, scientists that were working in the area where they have put this giant landfill in the middle of this community and even put open coal ash in this landfill. They said it, wasn't, it was harmful uh, from where they took it in Kentucky and then brought it to us and dumped it in our field and said it wasn't harmful for these black communities uh, or this black community that it now surrounds. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, you see uh, people who are suffering, and the reason why Cornell was there is because they're working with this community to see if they actually put this landfill on top of some of the ancestral grave sites mm -hmm. that sit there. And some of the residents have ancestors in these grave sites, and they date black back to slavery time. Mm. And, but also in that, this is the home of uh, Miss Juanita uh, uh, Abernathy, and I was able to see where Juanita and Ralph David Abernathy got married, where she grew up, the land she grew up on, and to speak of the Jones family, which is her original family, and knowing the resilience of this family, how they became one of the largest landowners in this particular town. Not only are they the largest land own in this particular town, but they're one of the only families in this town that never sold any of their mm. land. Wow. All, all people have been swindled, they have been bamboozled out of their land, but they had enough fortitude and resiliency that they said regardless of how they came at them and whatever tactics they came at them with, they would not give up the right to their land. Mm. And, and, uh, and, and the Jones family is still there and still running strong. I had an opportunity to ride with Mr. Alex Jones, who was her first cousin. Mr. Alex Jones is uh, in his late 80s now and you couldn't even tell it I mean he had uh, he moved around better than I did and I'm much 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 younger than Mr. Jones <laughs> <laughs> but Mr. Jones uh, was just a phenomenal human being uh, I met some other phenomenal human beings. Miss Esther Calhoun, who is fighting with every ounce of her being and has been fighting with every ounce of her being for a long time to alleviate this burden from the residents of Uniontown. Mm. And this is my, my brothers and my sisters, my family, my community. This is what, why we are here. This is what we are fighting for. This is why you're learning today, so that you can use the things, the tools that you learn, and be able to fight and help others to fight as well. So now we're working with Uniontown and with Cornell University to see if we can somehow contribute and benefit, uh, be a benefit to this community in relieving their burden. Wow, Rev. Powerful, yeah. powerful stuff in, indeed. And so, yeah, what Rev's talking about is if you remember the Kingston coal ash spill, uh, when that was cleaned up, uh, it was brought down and dumped on Uniontown, Alabama. That was what they considered cleaning that up, um, dumping on another community. So it, it was it was amazing uh, as we were sitting on the porch with uh, um, Mr. Uh, Bill and, and his wife, I can't remember, Gibson, Mr. Bill Gibson and his wife. And Mrs. Gibson um, just said, four people have died. Mm. And she just kept repeating, four people have died. Mm. Four people have died. At what point do we understand that four people have died as a result of this? Yes, coal ash is not innocuous. It is toxic. Uh, th th there is a reason that, that, that uh, folks wanted it cleaned up. 
And unfortunately, there's also a reason it was dumped on Uniontown, Alabama. And so now all those toxic heavy metals, uh, even radioactive substances, um, are, are, are there. And Absolutely. these people are having to, to live with that. Yes. Um, well, well, Ref, would you, uh, would you close us with an appropriate benediction? Yes. Well, if you would, let us pray. Eternal One, you who are almighty, everlasting, and all good, we say thank you. We thank you for this course. We thank you for the trainers as well as those who are here to be trained. Open our hearts, our minds, so that we may receive what is good, what is just, what is equitable, and strengthen us to stand for what is good, what is just, and what is equitable. Mm. We thank you now, in your name, amen. Thank you, Raven. thank you. Thank you. We look forward to being with you. <laughs>